Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for several things, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, why? That the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Now remember, the man of God there is born again believers, male and female. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God. That's you, that's me, that's us. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's exactly what you're doing because you're logged on. A workman, that's you, that needeth not to be ashamed. Oh, listen, you have the capacity to overcome your old sin nature rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through Operation Recovery, that's Rebound, Confession of Sins, and Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. That is the missing link. Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13, joined with 1 John 1, 9, is the missing link in the Christian way of life between operating in the flesh and operating in the sphere of the spirit. So why don't you take just a moment of time to prepare yourself for the study of God's word through that technique. I'll close out our prayer time, make a couple of announcements, and right into our Bible study. <clears throat> Father, we thank you this morning for all that are logged on. WebEx, Facebook, from wherever in the world that they're logged on. Well, this is a group of people that are hungry for the word of God, and I'm not the only pastor that's teaching the word of God, not the only one that's teaching it from a biblical worldview. But, Father, there's so few that are doing that, that uh, the, there's just pain in the heart for those who are suffering because they don't know and have the truth. So with that in mind, Father, we're going to turn this, this uh, Bible study over to you to the Holy Spirit to teach us the meaning of the words that come out of my mouth. And I'm praying, Father, that the time that I spend in studying the Word of God, that the time that Sir Darrell spends in studying the Word of God, that we'll communicate a clear biblical truth and truth so that those who are logged on with us will see that this is more than just a Bible study. This is life. This is life. And for the disciples that are logged on this morning, Father, I pray that uh, we'll give attention to the teaching of the Word of God. I pray that when the Spirit of God teaches us the meaning of it, that we'll believe it, cycle that into our right lobe as vocabulary, categories of doctrine, and really a con building a conscience on truth. So take this information this morning about the Apostle Paul and his pre-Christian uh, pre-Christian life and really his pre-Messianic life and then his pre-Christian life, uh, take all that information and show us how that might have an application to us today. And I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we are going to be in Philippians chapter, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, if we can get that far. If not, we'll pick up with where we left, uh, left off. And next Sunday, and uh, I just thank you so much for, for being logged on today and prepared to study the word with me. Uh, mark your calendar for August the 14th. That's two weeks from now, two Sundays from now at the uh, American Pie Pizza Again Bible Class Fellowship Luncheon. Get me a, a piece of information. Send me a text. Let me know that you're going to be face-to-face uh, -face with me so I can have notes and also have enough seating capacity uh, for all of us. I want to remind you this coming Sunday, uh, this coming Wednesday, Sir Darrell will be teaching, and I'm, I'm going to call him Sir Darrell. That's, uh, that's how we've known him uh, for a number of years. It's Darrell Anderson, but I, we call him Sir Darrell. He'll be teaching again this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock our time, Central Daylight Time in the United States, but it's Thursday morning at 8 o'clock in Mindanao. So I'm going to pray that you'll mark your calendar, be on with him, and listen, last Wednesday night uh, message was fantastic. And I'm not just blowing smoke, folks. When I look down this list and I see Angie and Bob and Wilma and Leanne and Brian and Steve and Annette, and just keep going down all the way down to Stephen, Stephen Bonds, at the bottom of the page. And if I were to call all your names, listen, I haven't taken this lightly uh, to, to ask Sir Darrell to take my place on 
uh, Wednesday, on Wednesday evening. My concern is that you're going to get someone who teaches in the same manner, the truth, and um, uh, teaches it in such a way that it'll be clear to you. Daryl is a master at PowerPoint. Listen, I can, I can pick it up, I can get it on my screen, but in terms of getting uh, information out there, I've done it, I've tried it, but I'm not uh, adept at that. But Daryl's a master at that, and the picture, you not only get the truth, you get to see it. And I'm going to pray that you'll continue to log on, spread the word. Well, <laughs> we're, headed, we're headed into the last days, uh, folks. We're just a, we're a day closer today than we were yesterday. But when you take a look and see what's going on, and I'm talking about seeing beyond what we're hearing as um, uh, truth is coming to us over the Internet, uh, coming to us uh, through the news, various news medias. Listen, there's more going on down, down in the deep part of darkness that we have no understanding of what's going on. So we need to be prepared for this. So, hey, hence the Bible study, okay? Tune in Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock our time, Central Daylight Time for Daryl, Thursday morning in the Philippines. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to turn to our, uh, our Bible study and pick up right where we left off, but we'll be, we're going to start in verse 7, but I want to lead up to that. Paul is talking about his pre-salvation life, sometimes he's referring to before he became a Messianic Jew. Then uh, other times he's referring to his pre-Christian life. He was a Messianic Jew, saved that way first, and then he was transformed into a Christian, into Christian life in the Arabian desert. And Paul's looking back on his life before he became before he became saved. And in verse two, he warns us. He warns us. And this is a warning to you. And this is why when we when I indicate that when you're looking at, uh, at the news, when you're trying to understand contemporary history, you will not understand contemporary history unless you're getting the truth regarding the news and from the Word of God. And there are certain news sources that you need to you need to consider so that you'll be able to interpret what is going on. I have people that are sending me videos all day long. It's amazing. Uh, I get done with a video and bingo, beep, beep, there goes the phone again. Somebody's sending me something else. And listen, that's okay because it's keeping me up to date and things that I'm not seeing where I have an opportunity to, to consider what I, what I have been sent. And here's the issue. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. That is, beware of the humiliation. And these were Jews who were unsaved. And what they were doing, they were keeping the law. They were distorting the truth. Paul teaches. He moves on. Somebody comes in behind him. The Judaizers come in behind him. And oh no, you need to be you need to be circumcised. Oh no, you need to be keeping the you need to be keeping the law. But the truth is, they weren't saved, and as a result, their circumcision actually meant nothing. And he, and Paul Paul calls a, uses the word circumcision, which means mutilation. Now watch this in verse 3. He said, for we are the true circumcision. And I indicated we have to be careful there because Paul is a born-again Christian at this point in time. He's talking to those at Philippi who are born-again Christians. But no, that's not what he's relating to. He's not saying all of you out there are, are uh, the true circumcision. What you have done is you've not only become a born-again Christian, but you've circumcised your heart. You've gotten this false information out. You're growing in Christ. As a, as a true believer who's focused in the right direction, but he says, here is the true circumcision. Those who worship in the Spirit of God. And when I see that verse, and I'm saying to myself, how in the world is it if we're studying the Word of God and we see here that we are to worship in the Spirit of God, in the sphere of the Spirit. How many Christians are don't know that? And they're 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 not really worshiping. What they're doing, they're they're functioning as a legalistic Christian, if in fact they're trying to, to be obedient to the truths that they're reading. So he says, first of all, the true circumcision are born-again Christians who are worshiping in the sphere of the spirit. That means living your life there. And taking pride in Christ Jesus and what he is, 
this is not pride in yourself. You're not proud about yourself, but you're taking pride. You're glorying in the person of Jesus Christ because of all that he has done for us. And the third thing is put no confidence in the flesh. <laughs> That's in your human life. That is you without being saved. That you as a carnal believer trying to live your Christian way of life. He says, look, put no confidence in the flesh. That's your humanity. Then in verse, verse 4, he talks about his own confidence in the flesh prior to the time that he became a born-again believer. And he said, although I myself, boy, that I myself, that's not just saying, hey, it's me. No, when he says, I myself, he said, although I could boast. No, he says, although I myself, myself could boast as having confidence in the flesh, if first-class condition Anyone else thinks he's confident in the flesh, he said, I have more reason. So what he's doing is he's looking at all these people out there who are Judaizers, and all they think they've they think they've just hit the top. They think they are the uh, the top of the lot, okay? And Paul says, Look, if you think you're confident, no, no, listen, I am more confident than you. And he goes on in verse five to explain his confident boosters, and there are five things that give him that kind of confidence. And these things, when you put these five things together, there's nobody else at that point in time who had any kind of confidence like he did of being the kind of person he needed to be. So he said, circumcised on the eighth day. That's one. He said, secondly, he said, I was of, of the nation of Israel. Hey, thirdly, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Fourthly, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And as to the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. Top dollar, okay? Now in verse 6, we see the function of Paul's confidence. And he says, as to zeal, Paul was a zealot. Oh, my goodness. He was focused. He said, as to zeal, he said, I was a persecutor of the church. And I indicated in last, uh, last Sunday that we need to be careful with that word church, ecclesia. There was the assembly in the wilderness in the Old Testament. There was my church, which was Christ's church. He talked about that in Matthew. And that was the body of believers on the day of Pentecost. That was his disciples after his, after his resurrection. So he said, I was a persecutor of these Messianic Jews. He said, and as to the righteousness of the law, he said, I was found blameless. What that means is he was keeping the law, friends. He was doing all that he believed he needed to be do, doing. Now we come to verse 7. And this is the new perspective, the new standard. So Paul's talking in these first six verses about what he was like and how good he was as, a, as an unbelieving Jew. He thought he was doing the right thing. But God says, no, that, no that, wasn't, that wasn't right, Paul. No, that wasn't right. So in verse 7, he says, but whatever things were gained to me, these things, he said, I have counted as lost because of Christ. What an amazing passage of scripture. Let's look at it. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, that's Paul, and Paul's gain was the seven fields of celebrity ship. See, we're talking about his celebrity ship, and he just gave it to us back there in verse five. We'll look at those again in just a moment. So he says, look at these things that I, that, that I, I have that's a part of me, these seven things. Well, these were the things that were gained to him. And he said, these things, Paul's celebrity ship gains, those same seven things, he said, I have counted as loss because of Christ. Now, what happens is you and I take a look at our Christian life or take a look at our life before our Christian life, and you might see some things back there that if you were, if you were a religious kind of a person, there were things back there that you thought maybe would give you oh, some kind of an assurance that you were going to, uh, go to heaven when you died. It might be the fact that you are part of a denomination out there. They weren't teaching the gospel, but all they're telling you, you need to be a very good person. And you have the standard of what goodness is. You're living your, you're living your life out and thinking all along the line that you are truly a born again Christian and that God's going to take you to heaven when you die. Only to find out at a later time that all those things that you were trusting before you really found out what it meant to be saved, you say, okay, I was trusting all these things, but now I find that they are absolutely worthless. Now, let's take a look very quickly again 
at the things that Paul says, no, nah, he said, I thought this was going to count for my life as far as my, uh, my life was concerned spiritually, but eh, I came to find out that they were worthless. So Paul recalls these seven celebrity ship items circumcised on the first, on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, zealous persecutor of the church, Messianic Jews, not Christians, and as to the righteousness which is in the law, he said, I was found blameless. Now look at the little box that I have off over the right. All those things that are listed there, those seven things, Paul was saying, look, boy, you talk about a celebrity. Boy, I was, I was top dollar. I was at the top of the lot. But now he finds out that, gee, Jesus is in fact the Messiah of Israel. He believes this. And guess what? All of these things that he counted for um, spiritual assistance prior to the time that he found the truth, all of them were useless to him. They were worth nothing. They were worthless. And so I've marked out all, all those seven items to show you again that Paul says these were lost. He lost them. They were of no value to him at this point in time. So then the question is this. Was Paul's celebrity ship a personal advantage or a personal disadvantage? Now, we're talking about Paul before he was, before he was saved. All these seven things. Here he is, top dollar. He's at the top of the lot. Nobody like him. Can't compare to him. So in the flesh, what we have then, it, see, he's in his humanity now. This before he becomes a believer. In the flesh, Paul's seven human celebrity ship items were an advantage to him. They were an advantage to him in, in the pre in the pre-Christian life before he became saved. But spiritually, they were a disadvantage to him. So while he's walking around town, he comes into town, he goes into the goes into the synagogue. He'll, hey, there's Paul. I, we've seen him before. Oh my goodness. Uh, he is some kind of a guy. Not only does he have this celebrity ship, but I'll tell you what, do you see what he's doing to those, those believers, those people that believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, listen, all this stuff that he had before he became a believer were worthless. They were an advantage to him then, but not a spiritual advantage. Spiritually, they were a disadvantage. They couldn't save anybody, including Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul. Then thirdly, in the field of legalistic self-righteousness. Now, what are we talking about there? And I, I want us to understand that um, Paul was a legalistic self-righteous person. But goodness, we have the same kind of, same kind of people living out a Christian life. Okay, you, you go into the Bible and you find 10 rules. And let's say, let's say there are 500 rules or 500 uh, commands in the Bible. I, I, I haven't counted them, but I know there's a multitude of commands in the Bible. And uh, let's suppose you're not saved. But, oh, you have, a trend toward, you have a trend toward asceticism. You want to do good. So you're out there keeping these rules, um, obeying these commands, thinking that you're all right. But all you are is, a, is an unbelieving, legalistic, self-righteous person trying to live out the Christian way of life. So in the field of legalistic righteousness, if we compare Saul with every, that's before he became a believer, if we compare Saul with every other legalistic Jew, Saul was the greatest self-righteous, legalistic unbeliever in the field of Jewish celebrity ship. But I think that if we're going to study the Word of God, we ought to ask ourselves, is there any kind of an application that could be made to me? Is it, do I, can I learn anything from this? And I think there is. Here's the contemporary application. Human celebrity ship, human celebrity status has no spiritual value. Now, just take that as a principle, okay? Human celebrity status has no spiritual value. In other words, it's, it, God, is not, God is not glorified. God is not blessed. He's unable to bless you or me if we're using our human celebrity ship, that status in life, to produce a spiritual life in our own life. So what we need to realize is that human celebrity status has no value. 
it cannot save you, first of all. It cannot improve your spiritual status after you're saved. And there is no eternal advantage to human celebrity ship. That is in the spiritual way of life. Salvation, phase one. It can't do anything for you for phase two. There's no eternal value. In other words, you don't have an advantage in eternity simply because you are a celebrity. Now, let me point out something here. As I was dealing with trying to understand what Paul is saying here, I, I'm thinking in terms of what constitutes a celebrity. Now, I'm, I've, got some, I've got some things listed here in just a few minutes, but after further thinking about this, I think that we can even go farther into, into describing what a celebrity is because you may look at yourself and say, well, I listen, uh, who might who might we consider to be a celebrity? Well, you pick somebody. Uh, it might be a, 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 excuse me, a musician. It might be a politician. It might be what it might be a, a big time pastor. Who is that? And you look at yourself and say, you know what? That that's that's not me. So I don't have to worry about this. Well, quite honestly, you don't have to worry, but I think we ought to be concerned about what constitutes being a celebrity. So first of all, we're looking here at a contemporary application for you and me today and saying that human celebrity ship, whatever that is, whatever that status is, you it has no spiritual value to you. It can't save you. If you're a born again Christian, it can't, it can't move you from babyhood to adolescence to spiritual adulthood and move you on to maximum spiritual maturity. And if you were to die in what you believe to be that status of human celebrity ship, when you, when you meet Jesus face to face at the Bema seat, there, there's, there's not going to be any advantage to your celebrity ship. So Paul takes a look at this thing then and says, again, whatever things were gained. And once again, I know this is redundant, but please bear with me. Whatever things were gained, this is Paul before he became a believer. He said the, the word gain here actually refers to Paul's seven, Saul, that Saul's seven fields of celebrity ship, circumcision the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, a zealous persecutor of the church, which is Messianic Jews, not Christians, and as to righteousness, which is in the law, he was found blameless. Those are seven celebrity ship items that Paul, that Paul had. And he says, look, whatever things were gained to me, whatever, whatever I was prior to the time I became a believer in Jesus Christ, goodness, those things, these seven things formed the basis for Paul's confidence in the flesh. Man, I'm okay. I'm okay with God. But Paul's human nature before his before his spiritual salvation is, again, what he's talking about here. His human nature before his spiritual salvation. Now, these are the things that the Judaizers used in their claims for celebrity ship, the very things that we've just named here that was true of the Apostle Paul. Actually, Saul of Tarsus before he became a believer. Now, here's, here's the issue. Celebrity ship. Y you know, look at point six here. Paul recognizes that every area of his seven human celebrity ships, when they conflict with Bachran, he came to realize that if those celebrity ships conflicted with Bachran or biblical truth, they were spiritually worthless to him. So he says, what, wait a minute, just a second. He said, I had all this celebrity ship out here and I thought I was on the top of the world. But the truth of the matter is, none of that, when I found the truth, he said, was worth anything at all. So Paul says then, in point six, he recognizes that every area of his seven human celebrity ships, when they conflict with doctrine, biblical truth, they were spiritually worthless. For example, here are some of those, those people that we might consider as celebrities. It might be a sports star. Goodness gracious, when I, after, uh, when I was a young boy growing up, Ralph Kiner, Wally Westlake, uh, Preacher Rowe, how about that? Preacher Rowe uh, was, a, was a pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, uh, uh, Roberto Clemente. These, listen, these were sports stars. When I, would walk, when I would walk into the clubhouse 
in in Pittsburgh at Forbes Field, put on that pirate uniform, uh, and stand around and talk to um, to um, any one of these any one of these uh, sports stars for Pittsburgh. And I'm saying, wow, you know, this is really nice. And I, I'm I'm thinking like I'm nothing but just a little old uh, ant crawling across the floor when I'm in this room and out on the mound throwing batting practice to uh, Danny, Mur- uh, Danny Murtaugh or uh, somebody like that. I say, wow, you know, in the presence of those people, I felt like nothing. Well, what happened, though? Look here. I look back at my own life and say, look, I'm not a sports star. I'm not a movie star. I'm not a TV personality. I'm not a musician. I'm not a vocalist. I'm not a politician. And those are areas of celebrity ship. And you might add some more to that. But I'm looking at, you know, what constitutes a, a, a celebrity? Well, it might be a sports star, a movie star, a TV personality, some kind of a musician, a vocalist, a politician, maybe a pastor of that humongous church that's out there, okay? These are these are people that might you might say are celebrities, and then when you look at them, you say, "No, no, I'm just the ant crawling across the ground." No, I've got a I've got another take on this, where where I could see myself considered as a celebrity. Can you know, listen to that? See yourself seeing yourself as a celebrity. For example, when I was 17, I went to Washington D.C. and I was working with the FBI. Well, can you imagine a 17-year-old boy growing up in the Ohio Valley and um, where you're just a small hometown, and you come back to town and, hey, the, the FBI agent is here back in town. Well, I wasn't an FBI agent, but, you know, it was one of those things where people looked at you and they said, hey, you felt like you were up here on the top. Oh, man, I'm an FBI agent. Well, no, I wasn't an FBI agent. I just worked with the FBI as a 17-year-old boy. How about this? Two years later, my really about a year and a half later, I signed a baseball contract with uh, with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I'm 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 signed by the very man that signed Jackie Robinson to a to a, a baseball contract. So I'm thinking to myself, Woo-hoo, when I come back into town again, look who's here! Look who's here! The the baseball star, and among the young people that were playing baseball, here I am. I'm up here on this top. Well, look, when I look back now, and then you say, well, what else, did, what else did, did you do? Well, you know, here I am 77 years old, 78 years old. I decided to get into Taekwondo. Well, within two years, I'm a first degree black belt. I'm in a world championship. I took second place, third place, and fourth place in four events. And I'm walking into a, into a, into a, a, a place where we're training and my picture's on the wall, and I'm saying, whoo, here I am way up here. But look here. When I look back, none of that, none of that has any value for my spiritual life. So what I'm asking you to do is to take a look at your own life. You may be the best school teacher in the world. You may be, you may be the best golfer in the world. You may be, you may be the best, mm, what is it you do? You are good at handling tools. And by the way, I'm, I'm just this off the top of my head. I don't know if there's anybody out here who's any of that or not. But what I'm asking you to do is take a look at this and see where you you finding yourself as a celebrity, not one of these world known, but in your own in your own setting, you are a very, very important person. And you sort of look up and you throw your chest out and you, your eyes roll back and you got this smile on your face. Listen, none of this means anything to God in terms of your salvation. Or whether you're, it doesn't it doesn't advance you one way, one bit toward maturity, and it certainly doesn't mean anything in terms of eternal value. So we're talking about celebrity ships, okay? So down in point six, we sort of named some some types of celebrities, gave you some examples, but I want us to see at the same time. Don't don't get puffed up about who you are. I had to come to that point in my own life. Well, I'm not puffed up because of who I am. I'm just another human being. But what I have is the same thing Paul had. I have Christ. And my focus and our focus needs to be on him. And that means every moment, every hour, every minute, every second of the day, we need to be focused on him. 
We need to be occupied with him, thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing exactly like Christ would do. And one of the tragedies today is that many, many pastors, yes, many, many pastors would tell you today, not possible. No, it is possible. The question is, are we going to learn what it means to be a Christian, living the spiritual way of life, and actually making the decisions to limit? Listen, we, we're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. The flesh and the spirit struggle all day long if you're trying to live out the Christian way of life. Now, as you grow, that battle seems to, to wane a little bit because you, you've, you've learned to habituate the truth rather than habituate the evil principle that you've been following in the past. So in point seven, before Paul became spiritually saved, he lumped what? Here's what he did. He lumped all of his human celebrityship, those seven things that we talked about, and anything else that he might have had in his, in his mind about who he was as an unbelieving Jew. Oh, my. He said, look, he lumped all those things together and called them gains. They were gains to him. They were of value to him, but it was, it was valuable, humanly speaking. And this is why when, when I look out and I see the number of people out here today across the world, and it doesn't have to be just in the United States, it could be in the Philippines, it could be in Japan, it could be in China, it could be in, your, in Ukraine, it could be someplace in Africa, where we have people who, are, who know there's a God out there. They know there's something out there that they haven't, that they haven't touched yet. But what they're doing is they're, they have this human celebrity ship. I think, well, because I'm doing this, because I think this way, this is, this is gain to me. It's, it's going to make me okay in the sight of God. God looks down and says, look, this isn't it. Until you find Jesus Christ and find him as your gain, everything else in life is worthless. So Paul called all these human celebrity ship areas, he called them gains to him. However, in point eight, after Paul was saved, he lumped all those areas of his human celebrity ship together again. So see, he's doing this again. He's, he's going through the same kind of motions. Before he saved, he lumps them all into one big old ball of wax and said, whoo, I am okay. Look here what I've got. But when he gets saved, what he does is he takes all those same things and lumps them into one big package again and then he superimposes divine viewpoint on that. And God says, let me tell you about, let me tell you how, about how important it is, Paul, for you to be circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, your salvation isn't depending on that. Well, wait a minute, Paul, just a second. You think because you are of the nation of Israel, you think that was important? Well, listen, this is all a part of that same ball of wax. And God just reaching down there, picking each one of them out of there one at a time and said, look, take a look at it now, Paul. So he takes a look at all that. He lumps them all together again. And those areas that were gained to him prior to the time he was saved, when you superimpose divine viewpoint, what does God think about the fact that you were circumcised on the eighth day, Paul? Or how about this? Anything that you, you might think. Listen, I go, to, I go to church every Sunday. Well, church is not, church is not a building. Church is you. So that's one error. I go to church every Sunday. Oh, yes, I carry my Bible with me, too. Oh, and by the way, I, I go to Sunday school class. Oh, I'm in Sunday school class all the time. And oh, my, we have such great fellowship. We sing and we do a lot of other things. But the truth of the matter is, all these things don't have anything to do with your salvation. Now, going to Sunday school class might help you if you've got a Bible teacher that's teaching the truth. But most most cases, that's not true either. Just reading from a pamphlet of some sort. What you need to do is to make sure you're getting truth from your pastor teacher. But the pastor teachers are evan the pastor teachers are evangelizing the saved, and the Sunday school teacher who doesn't even have the gift of teacher and doesn't have enough doctrine to do anything just opens the manual, says, "Here's what it says. Now, what do you think? You got seven Bibles." In the, in the Sunday school class, and each one of them reading gets something different out of it. All you do is come away more confused than you were when you went in. So Paul's taking all these things, superimposing divine viewpoint. What does God think about my 
um, my um, circumcision? What does he think about the fact that I'm of the law, a Pharisee? What does he think about the fact that, oh, my goodness, look at all those people that I killed, I threw in jail, I hurt, I injured, we had them stoned. Oh, my goodness, isn't that wonderful, Lord? No, he was a zealous persecutor of the church, and God said, that means nothing to you, Paul. And the righteousness of the law, listen, the fact that you were blameless, no, you were blameless before the law, but before me, you were guilty. You were guilty, and you needed someone to pay the penalty for your sins, and Jesus did just that. And Paul found that Jesus. So in these subpoints here, and, and, and what what things are, what things were gained to Paul? Well, moving on down here, let's go back to where we were. So Paul in point eight. However, after Paul was saved, he lumped all these areas of human celebrity ship together again. And by superimposing divine viewpoint on them, what does God think about this? How God sees his human celebrity ship. What did God do? He considered them to be of loss. That means of no spiritual value. Paul thought he was on the top of the world. God says, look, you're at the bottom of the list. You were the worst of all these. Then in sub point nine, he said, these things I've counted as loss. Why? Why did Paul cause these things to be counted as loss? He said, because of Christ. Isn't it interesting that before, before Paul really discovered Christ as the Messiah of Israel, Paul thought he was on the top of the on the top of the world. He was at the top of the flagpole. You couldn't get any better than this. But as soon as he found Christ, bingo, just draw a line, just X ever all that stuff out. And it was all because of that one person, Jesus Christ, and what what Christ had done for Paul and what he'd done, what he's done for the entire world. Paul could count everything but loss with Christ. He said, finally, finally, Paul realized that his human celebrity ship would not save him. So Paul came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel. Therefore, because he knew and concluded that Christ was the Messiah, what did he do? He believed that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. And because Paul believed in Christ, he lost all of his celebrity ship. So in verse 7, by interpret. By interpretation, here's what we have. I was hearing something outside. It's raining, and uh, there was a sound out there, and I'm hearing the rain on the outside. So here's an interpretive translation of verse 7. What category of things were gained to me prior to his salvation? These same things I myself have concluded loss. I've lost them all. They're worthless. Why? Because of this one person, Jesus Christ. Now, let's move on into verse 8. The surpassing value. The surpassing value. Paul's looking at uh, at all this celebrity ship. He said, ooh, it's great. But now what happens, he's considering them as loss. And we move into verse 8, where he said, more than that, more than what? Here it is, the last phrase. He said, I myself have concluded loss because of Christ, then more than that, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Well, let's take a look at that and pull this apart. Paul says more than that. That's more than what he had said in verse 7. And grammatically, that phrase, three words, more than that, grammatically, this is a strong attention getter. From now on, he's indicating concentrate on something. Concentrate on something. So here I am. I'm standing before you as the Apostle Paul. I have all these seven uh, status symbols that uh, have put me on the top of the world as far as the flesh is concerned, my humanity. And after, after recognizing that Christ is the Messiah of Israel, and he becoming, becomes a born-again believer, he says, wait a minute, more than that. And what we're, what we're indicating is, again, grammatically, this is a strong attention getter. So Paul said, more than that. Listen, more than that. More than that. 
And so what he's doing, he said, look, I've got something else to tell you. Uh, you know about the status that I have. You know about your celebrity status, whatever that happens to be. And you think it's okay. But now, I said, it's nothing. So more than that, he said, I count, and that word count there is conclude. I made a conclusion. And I've got some uh, subscript numbers here that I that I want to call your attention to, that what we're going to do is we're going to go back down after we uh, exposit this verse, and we're going to exposit a little more by taking a look at those words and saying, hey, here's what Paul's really trying to tell us regarding this word or this phrase. So Paul said, more than that, strong attention getter, listen, concentrate on what I'm about to say. He said, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord, for whom, Jesus Christ, I, Paul, I have suffered loss of all things. He says, Paul, listen, all these things that I had, everything that I thought that I had that was worth something, he said, when I believed in Jesus, everything I had, I lost. They're of no value to me. They're rubbish. So he said, I count them. I, I keep on concluding, and that's really, it's not just a count one time. Paul said, I keep on concluding these, um, these status symbols to be mere rubbish. We're going to take a look at that word. He says, why? So that I may gain Christ. Well, let's take a look at this. I have a number one by that word conclude up there in our verse. More than that, Paul said, I count all things. I conclude all things. Let's take a look at that phrase and that word, I conclude. Here that word conclude while functioning from within the sphere of the spirit. This is what this is what Paul's doing. He's functioning within the sphere of the spirit. As a result of that, he's able to he's able to draw a conclusion. And when Paul says, I conclude something, how about this? You're talking, uh, maybe you're talking to me, and we're talking about some facet of the spiritual life, and uh, I, I say something to you that you don't quite agree with. And I said, well, look here, I've, I, this is my conclusion. I have concluded this. And you look at me and say, well, aren't you just an arrogant kind of a person to say that you can conclude something that maybe I haven't concluded myself. So we need to realize that when Paul says, I conclude all things, here he, he's, he's talking about this. He's using this phrase, I conclude, while he's functioning in the sphere of the spirit. And therefore, we can conclude that Paul was not saying, I conclude, I count all things. He's not doing this in the realm of arrogance. But he's a, he's a spiritual being at this point in time. So what did Paul do? Paul drew a conclusion with total confidence that comes from his authority as an apostle, from his Bible study, his study of the word of God, from the revelation that Jesus Christ has given to him, asking the spirit of God to confirm those things that Jesus told him, and from his spiritual growth. So from his authority as an apostle, from his study of the word of God, from his spiritual growth, Paul is able to stand and look us straight in the eye and say, I conclude, I keep on concluding. This is my understanding. He is speaking from a spiritually mature status. You can't say this when you're a babe in Christ. Oh, you may have concluded certain things, but you can't conclude much until you become a mature believer. You're gaining information. And as you gain information, you say, yes, I have, I've concluded this in my life. Don't be afraid to say you concluded, but your, your, your conclusions that are good conclusions, consistent with the word of God, come when you've reached spiritual maturity. Here's a principle. Confidence that comes from spiritual mature status is no arrogance. And listen, this is why, um, let me see, I was talking to someone, I was talking to someone yesterday about a gentleman or a person that we know that's having a difficult time accepting a position that we believe to be true. And this person has, this person has indicated that uh, in disagreement, he said, you know, I'm going to die. I'm going to die believing this. 
Well, isn't it amazing that your confidence today could have, you could have better confidence about what you're believing today as you get more information. So as I look back at my own life and see the things that I taught back when, I was teaching them because this is what I was taught. And Daryl was talking this last Wednesday about, uh, you know, how long it takes you really to learn the word of God. This is why the, this is why the apostle Paul said, look, until, until I die, I'm going to keep hammering this. You're going to hear the same thing, the same thing, the same thing over and over and over again. So that when I die, I will be confident you will not have forgotten this. You will have learned it. And Daryl was talking about how long it takes you, it takes us, me, and others to really build a confidence in what we know to be truth. Because while I was confident way back when, for example, that uh, the, the body of Christ began in Acts chapter two, after many, of year, many years of putting the puzzle together, I had to go, uh, I had to actually draw a conclusion that was different from my major mentor. And when I did that, listen to me, when I did that, many of my so-called friends abandoned me, began to criticize me, and they're going to do the same thing to you, just making, making you aware. So you believe something today, but if someone comes along and says, listen, maybe you, maybe you need to understand this at a little deeper depth. And you say, okay, tell me what you're thinking. And they tell you, and you say, no, wait a minute, though that goes against everything I believe to be true. Well, listen, if the Spirit is teaching you, there'll be no disagreement. If you have the truth, you have the truth. But isn't it interesting that when you're putting the puzzle together, you may have the truth about one or two or five or ten pieces, but you don't have the whole puzzle together yet. And as you put the pieces together, you gain deeper insight, greater insight, understanding life better, understanding the word of God better, understanding God better, and your confidence is built. So here's the principle. Confidence that comes from spiritual mature status is not arrogance. And here's a truism. In this day of contemporary darkness, listen to me, please. In this day of contemporary darkness, and I'm just talking about the world out there, the swamp that we're living in. And I'm telling you what, folks, in the last, in the last three days, I have, I have learned about certain historical events that we've had, no, we've had no knowledge about up until this time. And when you see this, they're being called speculation. They're being called conspiracy theories, but when, and this is, this is information that the left is covering up, but when we discover it and you look at this and say, I can't believe that it's this bad, when in fact it is not just this bad, it's even worse than what we think because we haven't gotten to the bottom of the darkness. But what we know is we are living in a dark world, so that in this day of contemporary darkness, you Angie, Bob and Wilma, Leanne, Brian, let's go down the list. Let's name all of you. Let's look over here and see who's on Facebook. Let me call your name. So in this day of contemporary darkness, you will be persecuted as a Christian if and when you speak with spiritual confidence. Here's an application. By application, all things. What did he say up here? He said, I count all things to be lost. Well, let's talk about those all things. All things refers to any celebrity, human celebrity ship, any human achievement, any talent, any success, any popularity. Hey, I signed a baseball contract, a, a, um, a professional baseball contract. Hey, I have, I'm a second, uh, first degree black belt in Taekwondo at my age. Oh yes. Hey, I have a uh, just came close to a world championship. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, yes, I have a doctor's degree. Yes, I have X number of hours in, in college and, and, uh, and beyond 
uh, the, my basic degree. Oh, yes, I've got all these hours. And you look at me and say, oh, my goodness. Oh, yes, and I studied Hebrew in, uh, in o Oklahoma University. Oh, yes. Oh, you did all that? Oh, wow. So here's my human celebrity ship. I'm puffed up. My head is growing because of all this. God says, look, you better blow that head up. This doesn't mean anything in, in your spiritual life. No. So what that does, that causes us to reflect on who and what we are. We're nothing in God's sight until we become born again Christians. And taking in the word of God and growing. Well, let's take a look at this number three up here. Number three in our um, in our verse said, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ as my Lord. We want to take a look at that phrase, Christ as my Lord. Again, suffering the loss of all things refers to Paul losing his human celebrity ship, his human ability, his human talent, anything for which a human being can take credit. What can you take credit for in your life? Well, or whereby any human standard places a person in a status of fame, renown, and celebrity ship. Now, I've just given you two or three things in my own life, where in as far as the world is concerned, nobody knows me. But among my friends, people look at that and say, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. Look what that guy's done all, look what that guy's done at his age or whatever, you know. Well, as far as your spiritual life is concerned, these things mean nothing. So this is a, another area where I think that uh, probably has more application than, than what I'm even trying to convey here. So as, as we look at our own lives, you ask, ask God to reveal to you these areas of your life where your counting is really something, something great, you know, when in fact it's not really great at all. It's a human a talent. It's a human ability. Anything for which you can take credit. I was watching, uh, what is it called, cornball? I think it's where you take that, that uh, cloth that's got rice or beans or something in it, and you throw that thing from several feet trying to throw it through a hole on a board. I've tried that in the past. I, listen, horrible. I can't do that. Sometimes didn't even hit the board. But I was watching a, a, a tournament just uh, just passing through and saw some of these guys, and they would throw that that little bag. Uh, I don't know how many feet it is, but they'd throw that bag. It would hit that board. It would sort of spin and make a curve, go in the hole, go make a curve, knock something out of the hole, or throw that thing, and it'd go straight through the hole and just barely touch the sides of the hole when it went through it. I'm saying, wait a minute. Well, that's talent. But you know what? You take that talent and put it in a uh, put it in a spiritual in a spiritual sense. That talent means absolutely nothing. That ability, those things for which we take credit, it's it's worth nothing on the spiritual level. So we just take a look at that and ask yourself in your own life about some of that. Now he said, I count all this as rubbish. Look at that Greek word, number five here. The word rubbish, he said, I count these as rubbish. Now, as you read various versions of the Bible, they'll give you a different, different word there. Uh, they may not all say the same thing, but the same Greek word, skubalon, S-K-U-B-A-L-O-N, skubalon. And properly, that word means waste. It's used as waste thrown to the dogs, okay? Living in that day and, day and time, we've talked about the packs of dogs that are out there running wild. Some of these, sometimes you go into a, uh, into a country and you're out on the beach, there's a water, uh, water that's, uh, they're on a shoreline, and you go out to the beach and have a picnic. When you do, you better cover up your food because the dogs are going to gonna steal it from you. Just running wild out there in packs. Well, this is uh, the word scubalon is something that you throw to the dogs. It's like filthy scraps of garbage, table scraps, dung, muck, sweepings, human feces. This is, this is what I said. Look, you take a look at all this stuff. Figuratively, figuratively refuse 
what is good for nothing except to be discarded. So Paul looks at all these human celebrity ships. He's on the top of the world. You take a look at some of yours. I named some that I might, uh, in fact, uh, want to consider, only to find out they're dung. They're scraps of garbage. They're waste to be thrown to the dogs. Just sweep them up and throw them away. Good for nothing except to be discarded. That's what Paul says about your celebrity ship. So this whole this whole passage here, in these uh, in these few verses where we are now, we're in that segment of scripture where Paul is trying to say, look, some of this stuff that's important to you out here, it is absolutely unimportant to God and your spiritual life. So here's three ways to gain Jesus Christ because Paul says, back here in our verse. He said, I've, I've suffered the loss of all things, his celebrity ship, and keep on concluding them mere rubbish. Why is he considering the rub and them rubbish? He said, I'm going to get rid of this so that I might gain Christ. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at that phrase, what does it mean to gain Christ? And what I want to suggest to you, that in your humanity, there are three ways of what well, actually there are three ways that you can gain Christ. One of them is in your humanity. And in your humanity, you need to gain Christ, and you gain him when you understand that he is the Messiah of Israel, back in the Old Testament, in the Gospels. But when you become a born-again Christian, you now have gained Christ at salvation. So as an unbeliever today, in the age of Christ, in, I'm sorry, in the age of grace, we called it the church age, when you become a born-again Christian, you just gained him. So what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of all that celebrity ship where you think that somehow or another going to church, singing the choir, carrying a Bible, filling out your, uh, filling out your little slip, uh, giving a tithe. Oh, oh, yes, all this. See, I've got all that behind me. Listen, I'm standing on that. I know when I die, I'm going to, I'm going to heaven. And if I don't die, I'm going to get raptured if I'm here when the rapture occurs. No, three ways to gain Christ. Get rid of that celebrity ship, count it as rubbish, and believe in the, in the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who paid for, paid for your sins. He paid the price for every sin you've ever committed, past, present, and future. So here's how you gain him. First of all, you gain him by believing in him to be saved. Secondly, as a born-again Christian, you gain him because what you're doing as you grow to Christian maturity, you're becoming more occupied with him. You're thinking, you're feeling, you're speaking, you're doing more like him as you grow. So you're gaining him again. And then in, in, uh, after, at the point of death, or at the, uh, let me put it this way, at the point of, at the, point of the, uh, the rapture, or at the time of the resurrection, when you get your resurrection body, now what you've done is you've gained in eternity. You are now complete. So three ways to gain Christ. At salvation, growing as a Christian, and getting your resurrection body. Now I have a note here concerning this passage. Let me go back here and take a look at this. The phrase, I have suffered the loss of all things. What are we talking about? It's your, it's your celebrity status in life. Remember, it's not you're not the vocalist, perhaps, uh, on, a, on a national scale or a worldwide scale, but you may be the vocalist in the choir at the, at, at the, at the local assembly. Uh, you may be the, the best Sunday school teacher in the class. You may have something else that's going on in your life. You're good at this. You're good at something else. Oh, this is that status that just puts you on the top. No, Paul says, I have suffered loss of all things and count them as mere rubbish so that I might gain Christ. Now, there's a man by the name of Frank Gabaline. Frank Gabaline, I remember when after I became a Christian on the island of Trinidad. We're going out to the Baptist bookstore. We're looking for books to, to, to read, to study. Uh, uh, John Goad, uh, Chaplain John Goad was teaching the word of God, not only did he evangelize, he was also a Bible teacher. And so he was teaching on Wednesday night, on Sunday. And he's evangelizing also. But as a Bible teacher, we would go out into town to the Baptist bookstore in, uh, in the 
the capital city of um, of uh, Trinidad, and we would look for books to read, and he's giving us guidance. Guidance, and this is where I first heard about this man by the name of Frank Gabelin. Well, he was an American evangelical educator. He was an educator. He was an evangelical. He was an author, wrote several books. He was an editor who was the founding headmaster of the Stony Brook School in Long Island, New York. He is the author of more than 20 books and also served as the editor of Our Hope, which later merged with Eternity, a magazine. Also, Christianity Today, and early in my Christian life, we had, we were um, we had subscribed to Christianity Today. No longer do. It became a uh, a rather liberal uh, magazine, uh, turning from uh, from being a conservative magazine to liberal, and we got rid of that. And Eternity Magazine. So he was involved in all that. He was the style editor for the translation committee of the new, new international version of the Bible. How about that? Style editor for the translation committee of the new inter, international version, that's the NIV, and general editor for the 12 volume expositor's Bible commentary. And here is his comment on this verse. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I might gain, that I may gain Christ. Here's his comments. Actually, uh, what I've done is I took his entire comment. I broke it down a sentence at a time. So we'll t we'll read a sentence at a time and maybe make some comments about that so that it's just not reading a passage and moving on, okay? Gabeline said this. He said, no language could express a more deep sense of the utter worthlessness of all external advantages can confer in the matter of salvation. So he said, if you're thinking about being saved, if you want to be saved, he said, when Paul wrote what he wrote here, when he said, I have suffered the loss of all things, that phrase right there is the expression of a more deep sense of the utter worthlessness of all your external advantages. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. In the question of justification, made righteous, in the question of justification before God, see, before you are saved, you're lost, you're headed for the lake of fire. Go to hell, you're, re you're resurrected to go to the, uh, the, beam of the great white throne judgment. And you're cast into the lake of fire because all your goodness was worthless in terms of salvation. So in terms of justification, that question, being made righteous, all reliance on your birth. Oh, you take a look at your genealogy. Oh, my, I can trace my gene. I can trace my ancestors all the way back to wherever. Well, we're able to go. I'm able to go back to, to uh, 18, the year 1800. And we can't, I haven't been able to trace any further than that because my, my group, my family comes from England. And during the Second World War, the Germans actually bombed the, uh, the uh, religious centers, churches, and oftentimes they had their cemetery right beside the building. And all that got blown up of all the records. So we can actually trace back to 1800, and I look back and say, oh, my goodness, look at this. Look at this family line that I've got here. Isn't this wonderful? Oh, yes, they all went to church. Matter of fact, they're buried in the church in the church uh, cemetery at the side of the church building. Oh, my. So close to God, buried, at the, buried next to the building. Well, hold it just a minute. You see, the truth of the matter is, if the, in the question of justification, being made righteous, being saved, Positional righteousness, all reliance on birth and blood is your ancestry. And external morality, whoo, look here. <laughs> Lord, I'm sort of glad I've got a trend toward asceticism because I just do good all day long. No, <laughs> wait a minute. How do you know you do good? Well, look here. Someone says, oh, I saw you give your coat to that, that person who's freezing. Oh, yes, I saw you reach out the car window and hand somebody uh, some money for uh, for something to eat. Oh, I saw all that. Oh, yes, but the truth of the matter is all this external morality, all forms of religion, prayers, 
And I was thinking about this today. How many times, how many times when you're on Facebook, someone said, oh my, please pray, please pray, please pray. And then you see, you see people list their name. They don't list their name. They just, from their page, they say, make prayers. I'm praying, we'll pray. They'll make some sort of a comment. But when you realize that when a person is praying, if they're not clean before the Lord, if they're not praying in the sphere of the Spirit, guess what? They're prayers of absolutely no value. Well, I just pray all the time. Well, if, okay, if you're praying all the time, you realize, has anybody told you that all these prayers that you're praying, if you're not praying in the sphere of the Spirit, what do you mean nobody ever told me about the sphere of the Spirit? I don't know what that means. No, you just pray. No, no, you don't just pray. See, all of these things, your um, your morality, your, your forms of religion, your prayers, all the fact that you give alms. Hey, I'm a tither. I'm a double tither. Listen, every time I every time I have an opportunity, I give to somebody. Well, that's wonderful. But if you're doing any of this and not doing it in the sphere of the spirit, it is worthless. You think it's okay. You think that, oh, you're, you've got these kudos from God. You've got these, these wonderful vibes that are coming from God when the truth of the matter is they're worthless. So in the question of justification before God, being saved, your reliance on your birth, your blood, your external morality, your forms of religion, your prayers. Oh, I pray all the time. God save me. I beat my chest. I flop on the floor. All that is to be renounced. And in comparison with the merits of the great redeemer, the mer who's the great redeemer? The great redeemer is Christ. So when you take all these things, your bloodline, your birth, your, your external morality, your forms of religion, your prayers, your giving, unless those are renounced, when you compare that to the merit that comes from Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, those things that we do, our, our birth, our blood, our external morality, our forms of religion, our prayers, our alms, how are they to be esteemed? They are to be esteemed as vile, V-I-L-E, before the Lord. But when all we are is religious people, when we have not been trained in, in the Word of God and understanding the Word of God, you're looking out at millions of people in the world today. And this is why God wants us to be focused on Christ, that we might be the kind of witness in the in these days of the darkened swamp, so that those who get sick and tired of relying on their bloodline, on their birth, their external morality, their religion, their prayers, their alms, can one day look up and say, wait a minute, none of this is worth anything. And Paul says, I've given up all that, that I might gain Christ. Wow. Subpoint three here. How about two? Subpoint two. These were Paul's views. And we may remark that if this was so in Paul's case, it might also be true in ours. What's true in Paul's, Paul's life? Paul realized that all these uh, all these uh, status symbols were nothing. And what he needed to do was gain Christ by believing that Jesus, as a Jew, that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. And for you and I today, believing that Jesus died, was buried and resurrected for our salvation, eternal salvation. So you give up all that stuff. That Christ might be yours. And so point three, such things as your birth, your blood, your external morality, forms of religion, prayers, and alms, they can no more avail for you, for your salvation, than they could for Paul's salvation. So give them up. Now, I know that I, I don't think anybody online with me right now is falling under that, under that, that, in that category, not thinking you're saved and believing that you could be saved by that. But listen, you could think that maybe, maybe some of that is actually going to contribute to your spiritual growth. No, it won't. So here Paul shares the irony. Watch this. Paul says, I had all this stuff. I'm giving them up so that I might gain something else. So you look at all this stuff that he had, all this status that he had. Boy, you put that up there and just write A plus on it. A plus on it. In the human realm, it was a, worth A plus. 
But in the spiritual realm, just cross it out, F. Give, a, give yourself a double F on that. And so what Paul's actually indicating is giving up one thing, you lose one thing so that you can gain something else. So as a person grows in knowing Christ, as you grow in knowing Christ, you willingly, you lose your right to self-governing. See, you can either govern yourself or let God govern your life. And that governing, governing your life, and folks, listen, as your pastor, I can tell you for a fact that as I look at my own life, as I study the Word of God, I see just another area where God needs to govern my life when I've been governing it all along. Sometimes you don't realize you're governing it. But when the, when the Word of God is taught and you, you look at yourself and say, wait a minute, oh goodness, look what I've been doing here. I've been self-governing my life here. I've been going down the wrong path. I need to come back. I need to get on, get on the right path here. So as a person grows, as you grow in Christ, from babyhood to adolescence, to spiritual self-esteem, to spiritual autonomy, to maximum spiritual maturity. As you grow in knowing Christ, Christology, what do you know about him? See, many people are more, more interested in, in eschatology, knowing the future, than they are about knowing Christ in a full manner. So as a person grows in knowing Christ, that person willingly, willingly loses his or her right to self-governance. Why? To gain eternal significance in every scene of life by living in faith. Let's look at verse, verse 8 in terms of an interpretive translation. Philippians 3.8 says more emphatically, Therefore, even I also myself conclude all things, my human celebrity ship, to be lost for the sake of surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Look, the surpassing greatness, it's not just the greatness of knowing Christ, but it's the surpassing knowing of Christ. And listen, the more you know of him, the more you can think like he thinks. You can speak like he speaks. You can feel like he feels. And you can do like he did to be lost for the sake of surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, because of whom I have forfeited. I have forfeited all things of my human celebrity ship and achievement and keep concluding them piles of rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Now we're down to verse, down to verse nine and we've got about two minutes left. So rather than, rather than continue on with verse 9 for a couple of minutes, let's just go ahead and pray. Thank God for our understanding here and take a great look at what you think to be your own celebrity status. And I don't mean on a national scale. I understand that. But I want us to, want us to talk about our celebrity ship among the people that we know. Is that, what we're, is that what we're portraying? Do we want people to say, oh, look, yeah, be, just speak wonderful things about me because of who I am and what I'm doing? No, I want them to see me as a pastor. I want them to, I want them to see me as a, as a Christian who's living for Christ, thinking, feeling, speaking, and doing. Well, you've heard that enough. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this day, this wonderful day, as we take a look at Paul in verse 7 and verse 8. Talk about his celebrity ship in verse 7 and what it meant to him in verse 8 when he had to give all that up that he might win Christ. I know that when I look at the, the list of people that are online with me, Father, I think every one of us understand that our celebrity ship doesn't mean anything to us. I think we understand that when we look out at many people who are celebrities and saying, oh, what a, what a tragedy that they're trusting that to get them through life. When in fact, all it's going to get them is the lake of fire, eternal separation from you. Because they don't recognize and learn the truth. So continue to deal with each one of us, Father, and in, in, deal with us individually. About the, the, the flesh, the old sin nature, the things that we're hanging on to. Deal with us, Father. This is where, this is where the attention getters are coming. This is where the pressure comes, Father. 
So we need to ask ourselves if the pressure in my life is a result of something I'm doing wrong or is it because I'm doing right to strengthen me? May we make the right conclusion, Father, and like Paul, take all this status that we have, whatever kind it is, human ability, our, our, our capacity, to do cert, capacity to do certain things, call it all trash, get rid of it, and just learn the truth and do the right thing. And I praise you for that, Father, in Christ's name, amen. Two weeks from now, American Pie, consider that, mark your calendar, this coming Wednesday, Sir Daryl at 7 o'clock uh, Central Daylight Time, 8 at 8 a.m. in the Philippines. God bless you all, and good day.